So Ron came out, well actually Ron and Damon Evans came out in 2009 and presented here at the Marconi um, and did a presentation on flying robots and had a flying blimp. And if you go back and watch the video, it's up, it's online. Really interesting use of technology. Um, but if you don't know Ron, he, he's incredibly high energy. So for the last several years, beyond hybrid group, he's also involved with and has been driving a program called Kids Ruby. So yeah, round of applause for that. If you haven't seen Kids Ruby, check it out. There's actually an event going on tomorrow, and then there's another event going on in two weeks up in Bend, Oregon with Kids Ruby. It's about taking the education and teaching kids how to program. And we get kids from six, eight, more like eight, Yeah, if, if they, they if can they use type, a mouse, if, if they, they can, can use the iPad, keyboard and characters. Um, so I wanted to share one other quick story. I was at RubyConf 2009, and for those of you who don't know, I run a company called Confreaks. Uh, we record this conference and about a dozen other conferences each year. And at the time, we were still using robotic pan tilt zoom cameras. Really cool setup, incredible headache. Um, we ended up with the wrong set of cables. So I'm at a software development conference. Um, we went and bought a set of cables, and they were like 45 minutes away, because if you've ever been to, or if you were at RubyConf in 2009, it was at a hotel near the San Francisco airport. No electronic stores, reasonably convenient. We made the trek, we got a set of cables, we got back, there were no modem cables, not straight serial cables. Um, and they had molded plastic heads, so we couldn't just pop them open and rewire them. Um, so that basically means cutting the cables in half and then rewiring them. But in order to do that, you have to know which wires go to which pins. So we're at a software development conference. I put out a tweet saying, is there any chance anybody here has a voltmeter? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, about 15, 20 minutes later, Ron shows up with his voltmeter. Saved my ass. Um, yeah. Um, so we were able to wire the cables together, record the sessions. You can go watch RubyConf 2009 online if you'd like. Um, but yeah, Ron has been a tremendous friend throughout the community, tremendous friend to JR and I with LA RubyConf, and a tremendous personal friend. Um, so when it came down to who is the keynote speaker, this year, I basically kind of looked through, and, and JR and I talked a bit about who to do it, and it's like, you know, Ron has put so much energy into our community, and other presentations he's done, we just felt like it was high time somebody gave him the opportunity to keynote. So this is his effort, and uh, we're happy to have him here, and hope you all enjoy what he's got to do, what he's got to say, and I'm gonna let JR add something here. Ron, I just wanna add $395,000, $250,000, $180,000. If I you, break it, can I keep you it? You have over a million dollars worth of cars within 30 feet of you. Have fun. <laughs> Just call me Magnum. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. This is the Los Angeles Ruby Conference. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much to JR and Connie Fent and to Kobe for putting all the incredible effort that they put into organizing this conference. Everybody give them a big round. Give it up. They work hard. They do a great job. I am Dead Program. You know that. On Twitter, I'm Dead Program. I'm Ron Evans. I work at Hybrid Group here in Los Angeles. We're a software development company. And this is a keynote in three parts, because I don't know if I'll ever get asked to keynote again. So I really wanted to get it all off my chest. The signal.
In the beginning, there was the noise. And it was without any distinguishable form. So it was not very useful. Then man made the signal. And it was on. And it was good. That's what we need to communicate. We took these signals and we combined them together. And we made messages out of them. And with these messages, our entire universe, the universe of human thought, sprang into being. This man, Claude Shannon, he is the creator of information theory. He is the man who noted that through these simple two states, on and off, that our entire universe of thought can be represented. And yet, this was just reflections of an earlier idea, one which had been fallen upon by Ada Lovelace, that there was a difference, an abstraction, between things and the representation of things. And that this fundamental idea would then lead years later, to the end of information, to Stephen Hawking, with the entropy of information, positing that information had a life, that it could be born and that it could, in fact, die. Grace Hopper took this idea of the information, of the message, and said, we can represent communication in another form of abstraction, one where we use the same language to communicate with different kinds of machines. And then this man, that many of you may not know, whose name I actually couldn't remember myself, Kevin Ashton. Kevin Ashton, the man who coined the term the Internet of Things, the, de the device-connected future that we are all part of today. And then this man, Rob Pike. Rob Pike, a man who invented much of what we call Unix today, who gave an amazing talk on the differences between parallelism and concurrency that really influenced a lot of my thinking. And then this man, Erlang, the man who created queuing theory. And then last, but certainly not least, this man, Alan Kay, the creator of object-oriented programming. And the man who just realized that the message was the fundamental unit of communication. And then this man, Ray Kurzweil, a man who sees beyond the present into the future time. What they all have in common is something that Isaac Newton said. If I have seen further, it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. And so all of the people that I have shown here today are just a few of the people who have influenced some of the thinking that we've put into this talk today and some of the things that we're just about to show you. So remember, as you go through your journey of intellectual creation, that every thought you ever had was a message sent by someone else you didn't make that. And be humble. That ends part one. Creating the machines, part two. Ruby on robots. So for this, I would, I would like to introduce some of my colleagues at Hybrid Group. Here we have Adrian Zanuck. He is a flight engineer. My brother Damon Evans, test pilot. Sean and Gourley, photographer at large. So is innovation dead? A lot of people have asked, is there anything new in technology? Have we, have we invented everything that there is already to invent? Well, I say, I can't say that in public. I say nonsense, right? Innovation's not dead, it's all around us. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, is what William Gibson said. And isn't that true? It's very interesting that in 2009, when my brother Damon and I were in this very hall, with the first Ruby-powered unmanned aerial vehicle that we had pieced together, literally from all kinds of parts that we had ordered from China, and we'd get a very expensive microcontroller, and we'd blow it up the next morning, and we'd order another one. But these days, times are different. You can go to Sharper Image and buy a drone. You can go to Best Buy and buy a robotic vacuum cleaner. The future's already here. The robotic revolution has already started. But the problem is it's just too hard to actually do anything useful. When we did our Ruby-powered flying robot, it was incredibly difficult just to get anything at all to happen. Putting together the solution, it's not just the hardware, it's the software that actually makes it do something useful. That is what's holding back 
the state of the art of robotics. And so today, with great pride, I introduce to you R2. R2 is a Ruby-powered microframework for robotics and physical computing. It supports multiple hardware devices, different hardware devices, and multiple different hardware devices at the same time. Just think of those cables. In Ruby, everyone's going, ah, Ruby doesn't scale, right? How can you do this in Ruby? <laughs> Are you crazy? Yes. Because of something called celluloid. <laughs> celluloid is a framework created by the brilliant Tony Arciaghi, Bascule on Twitter, and it incorporates some very, very powerful ideas from some of the thinkers that I presented during my first talk. The two in particular that really are the most important are, are uh, Rob Pike's talks on concurrency and parallelism and Alan Kay's ideas on message passing. So celluloid is a framework which takes a very, very different idea towards the way that message handling is done. In Ruby, when we program in Ruby, we call a method and we expect that method to just take place right away. How naive, how 20th century. Things can happen in time and space, at different times. Wow, this is, is this what they meant, Rob, by, by concurrency? Yes, concurrency is when multiple things can happen at the same time. Not to be confused with parallelism, which is taking a task and splitting it up into smaller pieces, which can then be done concurrently. So that's where the confusion comes from. So celluloid is a very brilliant framework that takes this idea and says every Ruby object can now actually respond to these messages. It can now be an independent actor. And it can be asked to do things, and when it gets a chance, it can do them. And if we combine this with Celluloid I.O., which is part of the Celluloid infrastructure and ecosystem, Celluloid I.O. takes this same idea that we just talked about a moment ago in Celluloid, and it adds to it evented I.O., like certain other frameworks that everybody seems to think is the only way to do evented programming. Laugh. Go ahead. We all love JavaScript. Big hug. Celluloid I.O. takes the same idea of the actor-based message handling as Celluloid, but it adds to it, additionally, some overriding of the TCP sockets and the UDP sockets. So now we can actually have both a nice, clean, evented I.O. along with, and simultaneously, an object-oriented message passing architecture. How does this work? Well, it runs on JRuby, of course, because we need a Ruby implementation that is a virtual machine that actually has real threading. Or my personal favorite, the Ruby of the future, Rubinius. <laughs> Rubinius is a remarkable project, and uh, Evan Phoenix gave an incredible keynote a couple of years ago that. Um, was, was really remarkable where I think he actually built Lisp in Rubinius in uh, the course of the talk. So uh, Rubinius has a really remarkable threading model because it's built on the low-level virtual machine. So it's incredibly powerful, incredibly fast, and runs on a whole lot of different hardware platforms. So here's how R2 works. So we have a robot. And so we're using a couple of design patterns. We're using the adapter pattern. And in similar fashion to uh, Ruby on Rails having database connections, a robot in R2 has a connection to a particular type of machine using an adapter. This way we can actually have the abstraction, the difference between the single interface of communicating and how we actually get through the protocol to talk to it. This then will use various integrations, which could be different Ruby gems, and then communicate either utilizing a serial interface or, my preference, a socket to serial interface. Serial ports, you know, they're so old. And they don't work very well. But socket to serial implementations are available on pretty much every hardware platform you want. And now you have a nice, clean socket. You could see where Celluloid I.O. now, with its implementation of these evented sockets, can just plug right into anything which uses a socket to serial interface. Let's go on. So in R2, we have devices which have drivers. But a little bit differently, a device driver in R2 where the connections adapter controls how we communicate with the device in order to actually establish that basic communication. 
device drivers actually control behavior. So this way we have a place to look for how we talk to it and then what we tell it to do. And then last but not least, it uses a publish and subscribe architecture in order to send events back to the robot when different things occur in these device drivers. Again, something that normally you might think you can only do with certain specific languages, but of course, you know, in that case, there's only a single evented I.O. per process, as opposed to celluloid, which has many, many, as many as your system can basically handle as far as memory and other resources. But that's not all. Because what good is a robot unless it has an API? I mean, you know, as above, so below. Just like the basic signals that the great masters used to compose the messages, which were then composed of other messages, which built the internet, which built the internet of things. So any system requires both ingoing and outgoing interfaces. And so in R2, the API that any robot has, it goes through something called the MCP. <laughs> so the, the master class will then communicate with each of the different robots which are running in that particular cluster or swarm again, communicating with their own individual hardware, and then either utilizing a RESTful HTTP interface or utilizing WebSockets, since you need a way to communicate in real time with the different you know, hardware devices, which typically will put out all sorts of interesting data. So show me the demo. I mean, you know, that's all, those are great ideas, but let's see something. All right, we're going in, and we're going in full throttle. All right, so let's see. First of all, let's uh, bring up the camera. Yeah. We have a camera. And here, um, my brother Damon is going to introduce one of our favorite pieces of hardware. The Arduino. Many of you have probably seen them, used them, aware of them. Uh, when we first began working uh, in, in hardware and robotics, um, these were fairly new devices that you could only find on the internet or you had to build them yourself, get them in kits and parts. This one we bought at Radio Shack, uh, so the shack is back. <laughs> um, uh, we could, could put together a prototyping board so that we could conveniently link all the different hardware components together so we can have a nice, clean little package. The button, uh, well, we just needed a giant button, and so we ripped the guts out. And uh, So let's look at some code. Set up. Let's look at the code. So here's an example of a very, very simple R2 program. Can you guys see this okay? Is the font big enough all right for you? OK. So uh, here's a simple R2 program. We require the R2 gem. And you might notice, where's the class? Well, we're very influenced by Sinatra. One thing about introducing young programmers or new programmers is they get very confused about the idea of class. And so we thought, wow, let's you know, utilize some of these wonderful techniques which have already been developed by members of our community. So here we see we have a connection that we're calling Fermata that's using the Fermata adapter. Fermata is a universal serial protocol that you can use to communicate with any of the digital or analog I.O. that's on any particular Arduino that's running that sketch, which is the name of a program that runs on an Arduino. And it's communicating via this port. We're using the socket to serial interface. And so then we have two devices. One is the board itself, and then the other is the canonical LED. Yes, we're going to make an LED flash. All right, so. In R2, we do some work. I mean, robots are here to do our bidding, right? So uh, don't ask them. For so now. the work that we're going to do, first we're going to query the board for its firmware name. Then we're going to display the board's version. And then every one second, we're going to toggle the LED. So it should flash. So let's go over here to the, I'm running my serial to socket interface. It's still running, this is good. And here's my sketch. And uh, you got the camera on there? Yeah. It's not quite enough room for all these things. <laughs> Close enough. Oh. Yeah, we'll do that later. It'll get easier. This was the largest LED we could find conveniently. <laughs> All right. Well, that's kind of fun. To get brighter LEDs, you need special permits. <laughs> All right.
right, so let's see here. So I can see. All right, so now let's run another example. That was kind of neat, but how about some interaction? I mean, uh, you know, I heard that this technology was interactive. So we're going to run another sketch, or a program rather. This one is the Fermata button. So in this case, we're going to have two devices. We don't care about the board version. We already know that. Still the same Fermata, still the same LED, but this time we're going to use a device called a button, which has the button driver. So the button driver is wired up so it's able to query the Fermata and get the button events. And so the work that we're going to do is on a button push, we're going to call this Ruby method, which happens to be an anonymous procedure, telling the LED to toggle. So that's going to turn it on and off. All right, so let's go over here and see what happens. Okay. All right. See, this isn't quite as easy as it looks. All right. So now we're connected to the Arduino. And it started the driver. And so now if I push the button, the light should light up. Hey! A $3,000 lamp. <laughs> Don't tell the investors. Shh. I can turn it off, too. Hey. All right. Well, that was fun. All right, so we made a light flash. That was kind of interesting, but uh, can we do something more impressive? I think we can. All right, let's do it. Let's see, somewhere in here. Yes. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, disconnect the serial port because I need to give this to my colleague Adrian for the next thing that's going to be coming up soon. And I fried a couple serial ports, and it's very scary, especially with all of those automobiles. I've been assured we do have insurance coverages, but, uh, you know. All right. Yes, that's what I've been told. <laughs> All right, so we're now we're going to uh, introduce a new piece of hardware. The Sphero. Anybody know about the Sphero? The Sphero is an awesomely amazing toy, which is actually a very sophisticated robot in disguise. Yes. So uh, this is a, um, a very cool, it's got motors inside. Oh, well, Damon, you tell them about it. Uh, the Sphero is uh, essentially a robotic ball. It's fully enclosed in plastic, so I believe it's waterproof, though we haven't tested it to much depth. But if you want your dog to play with it, that's fine. And within it, there's basically a number of sensors and motors that cause the ball to, by changing the, the weight distribution of it, can cause it to roll. So also a number of LEDs inside that flash, so you can change colors and do all kinds of other fun stuff with it as well. Why don't we show them some fun stuff with it, Ron? I'm just connecting to it via Bluetooth right now. You know Bluetooth. Mm. You talk on it all the time. So adorable. Little robot ball. Hello. Pretty colors. Hello, Sphero. Flashes a nice soothing light. <laughs> Aha! We are connected. When it changes color like that, we... Uh, the stable color, now we are glowing. We are ready for action. All right, so let's look at this little uh, R2 program. This one, again, requires R2. This time it makes a connection to a Sphero using the Sphero adapter um, on port uh, 4560. And hopefully I won't, do I do you think I'm gonna need the, uh, do you think I need to put in the uh, local IP? Yeah, probably. We're running to some, uh, Internet access problems. That never happens, right? All right. So we're going to use the Sphero device with the Sphero device driver. And in this case, the work it's going to do is every three seconds, it's going to roll at a speed of 90 in a random direction. The drunken Sphero walk. So let's see what happens. The Sphero's been getting into the bureau. I'm sorry? Uh, percentage of throttle. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, this actually has a fixed velocity. 
<laughs> that was pretty good. All right, so let's see what happens here. All right. And let's bring up the camera. This is kind of an interesting way to do it. Uh. Hmm. Ah. I if all works well. Yes. Sphero. You know, you know, I think I think our little Sphero looks looks kind of lonely there. Well, let's make it do some other tricks first. You know, if we wanted to have a friend, it's kind of mad at us. It's like, wait, what did you say? <laughs> All right. So um, the Sphero actually has sensors, and where are the sensors? They're hidden deep inside of its Spheroness. <laughs> so actually, it has those accelerometers. The, um, if you pop one of these open and you can figure out how to get it back together, let me know. But if, no, actually, if you get them open, um, Sphero is actually amazingly durable. The dogs carry them around, you can drop them in the pool. If you get them open, though, they have an incredibly sophisticated accelerometer and a couple of motors in there. And uh, we can actually configure it so that we can detect the collisions. So the Sphero, we can tell it detect collisions, and then every three seconds, while we're telling it to roll around, and let's give it a little more velocity. You know, we got to put in the IP address. That's going to be the exciting pair of programming of the IP address. Every three seconds, we're going to roll around, and unless it's got no collisions, tell us what they are so we can display the messages. All right, that sounds kind of interesting. Let's do that. So, Sphero, messages. Configuring it, it's rolling. Rolling. It hit a collision. It's rolling some more. Oh! Uh. <laughs> Dear little Sphero. Let's see if it gets more. All right, so we can actually get messages from it. All right, that's neat. Wow, what else can we do with this thing? All right, let's take a look if we can change its color, colors. So in this case, um, we're going to use the set color and we're going to use Ruby's modulus so that we can alternate between green and blue. Pretty. <laughs> the balls are so beautiful. <laughs> don't you just want to go into the light? Or are you supposed to stay out of the light? I don't know. I could never get that straight. All right. Well, that was neat. What, what else can we do with this thing? Well, let's get a second Sphero. Because we need a swarm of robots. I mean, one robot alone is no good. This is the modern era. We need a swarm. So uh, let's take a look at this little bit of code here. Um, in this case, we're actually utilizing uh, R2's ability to define a class, again, very similar to Sinatra's kind of pattern. So we're defining the Sphero robot. Again, it's the same adapter, the same driver, and uh, doing the same work. The difference here is we're going to define two Spheros. And I did this uh, through a hash just because I uh, occasionally do run it through my serial port. So in this case, uh, this port is going to be talking to this Sphero, and this port is going to be talking to this one. Then for each of those, we're going to start a new Sphero robot, connect it up to that port, and then tell them all to do some work. All right, let's see what happens. First thing we've got to do, though, is hook up to the other Sphero. Is it awake? It is awake. Let us see. We had to write a little script to get through the madness of Bluetooth. Because the things I've done to my machine. Oh, OK, it's ready. Sphero 2 is connected. All right. So let's see this happen. Sphero 2, go. Oh, no. <laughs> 
Sphero 2, no. Oh, wait, we've got to change the IP address. Uh. This is how you know it's live, people. <laughs> That's right. We're not faking. We would do a much better job if we were faking. <laughs> All right. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Sphero 2 is a roll. Sphero 2, engage. Oh, go, go, Sphero! Each other. Uh, they're kind of standing away from each other right now. It's part of the game. It's part of the game. One that's creeping closer. It's curious. They're shy. They're shy Spheros. I prefer to think timid than shy. <laughs> the mating dance begins. <laughs> Soon there will be three. No, really. We weren't kidding. We're going to skip pa forward past that part because this is going to be on video and kids will watch it. And the reproductive uh, cycle of the Sphero is something we're still working on. <laughs> this isn't the robot Playboy channel here. Playbot? Playbot? Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to hook up a way more Sphero's now. So let's start waking them up. Because that could take a while. Because, you know, like all toys, they think like when there's people around, they go to sleep. Tell me when the color changes. It looks like it did. Robot 3 is connected. Robot 3 online, going for 4. I really like their three-digit codes. They make me think of, of airports I've been to. Sphero 4 engaged, Sphero 5. <laughs> I'm like, where is this one? I think, I think Corey's been this place. I haven't, but. The white Sphero is for the immediate loading and unloading <laughs> of robots only. <laughs> Sphero 5 Oh, engaged. Sphero 5 engaged, going for six. Hello? Hello, little Sphero. Come on, Sphero. Hey. Sphero six engaged. Going for seven. And then we will have Voltron Force combined. <laughs> it sounds busy. What is it doing? You know, some of us are, have other things to do, you know. There's always a lazy Sphero. It's always the last one. Okay, we're online. All, All right. Seven Spheros connected. Seven Spheros. <laughs> but we haven't done anything yet. <laughs> but you guys are nice. All right. So let's go back to that code. I mean, that we've, it's been so long that we forgot. So uh, it's the same exact code, except way more Spheros. All right. That sounds, uh, like, that sounds doable. Oh, damn. <laughs> this is great. You guys are so awesome. I know, and you're like, learn how to use your editor, man. <laughs> if you've used as many of the editors as I have, you can't keep them apart anymore. <laughs> I switched away from Vim because I got stuck in caps lock escape mode and I could not get back out. It was <laughs> and I had used it for years in that mode. No. <laughs> All right. All right, let's do this. Sphero. Sphero multiple. Multiple Spheros. Are we ready? We appear to be ready. Uh, we're as ready as we're going to get. As long as there's batteries, we're ready. Ooh. Not so ready. <laughs> Let's take a look here. Oh, wait. I forgot I've got to turn this off because with no Wi-Fi, things get weird. And it's a party. <laughs> All right, cue up the music. They're so cool when they do this. Exactly. Correct. You got the right idea. Rolling, rolling, rolling with some Spheros. I think if we had like a plexiglass dance floor over it and Spheros under them. Yeah, right. There is an application for robotics after all. All right, 
You know, this is weird. Yeah, they, they, can, they almost look like they're alive. I know. Wouldn't it be cool if they were alive? Well, that would be really cool. Well, you know, that's what we thought. So we decided, <laughs> we decided, you know, because, uh, you know, there's this code retreat thing where they keep talking about this Conway game of life. So we thought game of Sphero. All right, so let's take a look at how this works. So uh, in this case, the work that they do is first they're born, then every three seconds they move if they're still alive. Then every 10 seconds they have a birthday. Because boy, life is quick in Sphero land. So They grow up so fast. I know. All right, so uh, they're alive if they're alive. And so from birth, they're born to detect collisions with an age of zero and with life and movement. So when they have life, they are green. And what's life without death? <sighs> kind of heavy, huh? I'm afraid for the spheros. <laughs> no, they turn red when they're dead. Oh. And they stop, and then worst of all, they terminate. <sighs> but, hey, not all is bad. They have birthdays. In this case, um, the problem with the Sphero, I guess, I don't know if it's a problem, but they, they move by touch. They have no eyes, so they have to reach out and touch someone. So very touchy feeling. Uh, the traditional interpretation of Conway's game of life is that you use some type of proximity. And uh, also, we're in the real world. There's no lines out here, man. Like it's, it's all over the place. Physical space. 100% cool. grid free. That's right. Grids are so limiting. So anyway, the way that we do this here is we actually detect collisions as a way of determining the proximity that more traditionally would have been calculated through Conway's game of life. They like to bump it. So in this case, we say they're dead unless, let's say they're dead unless they have between three and five contacts. And then movement. And here's all our spheros from before, except with the, uh, yes, you remember this, don't you? <laughs> I'm kind of slow, but eventually I remember. See, they're all different ports. So it's like, eh. oh, those, those silly ports. All right. So the spheros are on. Let's see what happens. Conway Sphero. Go. They're alive. But for how long? And another one bites the dust. <laughs> the last Sphero. Come on, little guy. You can make it another birthday. Come on. Come on, Sphero. You can do it. You can do it. I, this has got to be depressing. <laughs> you think it's going to go Donner, Sphero? It's stuck. It's trapped under the bodies of its fellow Sphero. Wait, no, it got away. It got away. Wow. You know, I can't kill it until it stops on its own. I, would, I just would feel terrible. There's always one tenacious one that just hangs out. This one's, uh, you, it's made it to five. That's pretty good for a Sphero. Oh. oh. And they're dead. Well, you know, I, I don't know if I could take any more death. I think we should just move on to the next thing, don't you? Yeah, I, I, I'll dispose of the, the, the bodies. <laughs> oh, very well. <laughs> Goodbye, little Sphero. All right. So um, we're about to get crazy. Let me, let me shut these things down here. Shut down Sphero. Seven down. Six down. Oh, you see, they only terminate when you don't want them to, and vice versa. They're Murphy's Pharaoh. I think it's because we're doing things with them they maybe weren't meant to do. Ross from Robotics is here, and he can answer that question. It's like, you yeah, know, you guys did something kind of weird with that thing, and there's so many of them, too.
just if I don't shut this down, it gets very unhappy. And I told you I need a new machine. <coughs> All right, so, so uh, we're going to do something now completely different, right? Wait, not completely different. Hold on here. Uh, where is this code? There we go. All right. So you've seen the Sphero. You've seen the Arduino. But there's an R that we've yet to bring out. Yes, there's one more R. You guys, can you guess what it is? It's the AR drone. Arr. You know, we can't, you, you don't want to fly from there? Okay, sounds good. All right, so, um, so in this case, um, we really need to fly things, right? And I, you know, they said, you guys going to like ha bring more blimps? Because we're, we're kind of nervous. Like, no, we're not going to bring any blimps, are we? <laughs> no, no, we don't even have a working blimp ourselves right now, do we? No, no. That's right. So uh, actually, the truth of the matter is, my brother, he, Damon told me, look, I'm really tired of carrying giant tanks of exotic gases on my shoulder through strange cities. Not to mention through airport security. <laughs> and your voice, it's so cute. And they're like, uh, you can keep this helium if you drink it here. All right. What do you mean secondary inspection? <laughs> All right, so um, because the uh, AR drone um, tends to run a little oddly in its infrastructure mode, uh, we're going to run it in ad hoc mode, which means it's actually going to be its own uh, Wi-Fi access point. Um, we've actually run it in infrastructure mode, but with so many people here who are on the same subnet, we thought, you know, someone's going to be thinking that's real funny. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look. So again, this time it's a connection to the AR drone using the AR drone adapter. We're using the device drone using the AR drone driver. And then the work we're going to do is first we're going to start. Then we're going to take off. Then after 25 seconds, we're going to land. And then after 30 seconds, we're going to stop. Now, if all goes well, that's what happens. <laughs> if that's not what happens, people in the front, get out of the way. Especially mom and dad, you guys. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> all right. Let's go to the camera. I think we're as ready as we're going to get. <laughs> you know, when you're plummeting, 30 seconds seems like an eternity. All right. So that was, that was really, really cool. But, you know, I feel like there's, there's something more. Didn't we promise them that they could actually run more than one hardware platform at the same time? Yeah, and we did. Oh, oh, OK. Wait, first, wait. Sorry, sorry. I lied. One more thing first. So. We can get navigation data. The Sphere, or sorry, the uh, AR drone, um, it's actually an interesting device. You connect to it via Wi-Fi, and it has several different Wi-Fi ports, IP address ports, some of which mostly you address via UDP, some of which via TCP. Again, we're able to take advantage of celluloid IOs, uh, evented IO. And in this case, the uh, drone, again, we're running the drone, same as before. Now we're going to make a connection to it's navigation, which is running on a different port, so it's a different connection, again, through a different device, this time the AR drone navigation driver. So the work we're going to do is a little different. The on nav, which is when we get nav events, called update, the on nav update, we're going to call this particular method nav update. Then we're going to start and take off. After 50 seconds, that's kind of long. Let's, get, let's put it back down. Oh, actually, no, let's, let's turn it back up so we can actually see the data. 
Yeah. Okay, 50 and 60. So now, uh, every time we get a nav update event, it's going to call this particular method, which is just going to grab from that data the drone state and dump out the params. So it should spew a whole bunch of drone-related data. All right, so let's go back over. Uh, this is our universal video adapter. <laughs> it's called Linux. There's the nav data. Oh, it's coming back. We named this one Wedge. Because it survived. Porkins didn't make it. No, seriously, Porkins didn't make it. We could show you the damage. Just a little word of warning about the Arrow drones. Um, the, the drone has the initial purchase price, and there's also the spare part subscription service. <laughs> All right. AR drone. All right. All right, now I get to, I jumped the gun. So we promised you multiple hardware platforms, and uh, at the same time, that's right. So let's pull all the stops, everything all at once in the mother of all robotics demos. <laughs> all right, so again, the AR drone, we're gonna grab its navigation, and this time we're gonna hook up an Arduino too. And uh, this is gonna again running the Fermata protocol. This time though, we're going to be using a device called Classic, which is using our Wii Classic controller driver. Yes, we're going to fly this. My brother Damon here, it's his fault if it crashes. Our test pilot, our brave test pilot, is going to fly it using nothing more than his concentration and a Wii Classic controller. Indeed. All right. There's the controller. Honestly, the, uh, the slippery screen of an iPhone is probably not the best way to control a flying aircraft in any case, so this is a bit of an upgrade. Initiating free flight sequence. <laughs> Standing by. Free flight sequence complete. Nav data. Initiating engine start. Initiating takeoff procedure. We have liftoff. And we are now controlling this, or he is controlling this. I have nothing to do with it. All right. Ruby, Arduino, and Parrot all at once. Oh, but there's more. Yeah, we, well, there's even more, because you know there's a camera on this thing. And we're actually pulling in the video feed, too. All your data are belong to us. We just really, really love things that fly. What's that? Oh, I wasn't able to to bring it up before because of... I think my computer can do it though, right? Oh, okay. Let's All right, let's give it a try. We're, we're gonna get really crazy and experimental. <laughs> we actually have the API running, and it's a full web-based interface. Right now, uh, Adrian's actually... Uh, I'll hold the camera. Okay. You browse the interface. So here's our drone. Where's the mic? You fly, I'll hold the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so there was our... Uh, here's our drone. And each drone has different connections and devices. So here we have the drone, the navigation, the Wii Classic controller, all communicating at once. These are the ports and the IP addresses that they all communicate with. And you can drill down into each one and get specific information about that connection that is fed from WebSockets, which are not on here right now. I believe now. we disabled so that we wouldn't take any extra chances like you are right now. <laughs> yeah. I had to get 
crazy with it. The Ferraris are making me hot. <laughs> can you make it? Can you make it go fast? Maybe. No traction. <laughs> the only thing about this versus the blimp, this thing really does inflict pain. I have the scars to prove it. Yeah, we've all lost a little bit of flesh in our pursuit of robotic excellence. All right, can, we, can you bring it in? Wait, wait, wait. All right. No problem, no problem, I got it. <laughs> Gonna invade the Spiro's home here for a second. You can make it almost there. Wow, that was really, really awesome. Here, I'll hand you the mic. Woo! Wow, that was so fantastic, you guys. Give it up for our test pilot, Damon Evans, and our flight engineer, Adrian Zankic. Novel control schemes. Extremely expensive automobiles. Who could ask for anything more? Boy, was that fun. Wow, that was really, really excellent, you guys. Thank you. All right, so that concludes part two. Part two. So there's more. So if you want to see this, it really does exist. I swear, what you just saw was real. You didn't imagine the whole thing just because of your presence around Ferraris. So go to r2.io. It's uh, all up there. You can check it out. It's on the GitHubs. Please fork it. Give us pull requests. Check it out. Uh, also, um, r2.io is our Twitter address. And we brought our friend Ross from Orbotics. Ross is a really great guy who does a really fantastic job of telling people about the awesome Sphero. And he was kind enough to bring a Sphero to give away to one lucky burgeoning robotics developer. All you have to do is tweet both R2IO and Go Sphero between now and the end of our talk. So you best get on the internets. This could be yours, glowing little ball. It's so cool, you'll never go to sleep again. <laughs> Until the battery dies. The spheres, they'll roll up and cuddle with you. They'll play with your foot. Is that the sphere? <laughs> um, <I th> <laughs> All right, so yeah, tweet R2IO and go Sphero together to win. All right, part three. Welcome to the machines. So, what about robot economics? I mean, if the robotic revolution is already here, as we seem to have indicated, what, what are the consequences for humanity? What about the repercussions of automation to the traditional human workforce, which is us, right? What about robot ethics? Do robots have a compulsion a program to treat each other a certain way? How do they interact with us? What is going to happen? Well, I'm here to tell you exactly what's going to happen. I don't know. My dear friend Dan Rasmus is a professional futurist. And uh, he likes to tell me uh, being a futurist means never being wrong today. <laughs> now Dan uh, wrote a fantastic book called Listening to the Future. And in it, he did, uh, teaches a technique known as scenario analysis. So I thought, let's do a little scenario analysis of the future of humanity and robotics. So I created a little visualization. On the one axis, we have robot sentience. Will the robots become intelligent on their own or not? And then on this axis here, we have robot friendliness. Will they be friendly or not? And because we are here at Los Angeles Ruby Conference, everything we talk about is going to be in terms of movies. It's a very high concept. All right, so let's say, for example, if the robots are not friendly and they're not intelligent, in other words, pretty much like today, we end up with the movie Brazil. Nothing works. I know. 
Harry Tuttle, heating engineer, where are you now? So now, if the robots are not friendly, but they do become intelligent, we end up with Terminator. Although I, I personally have a theory that they will simply leave Earth with all of the resources and not bother wiping us out. Robots are there friendly, but not intelligent, is cyborg. That's what I wish to become. And then, last but certainly not least, the utopian vision of singularity. If the robots are intelligent and they are friendly, will we become their pets? Will we become their friends? Will we become one with the robot? Well, this guy had a few theories and opinions about this, and he wrote in a very, very large number of books. Anybody know who this is? Oh, of course you know who this is. Are you kidding? And that means you also know the three laws of robotics. Number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And number three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or the second laws. Now, when Asimov first wrote these down, long before my birth, he, he really did believe in a vision of future history. Well, how's that working out for us? But it's not really fair to blame the robots because these are not robots, they are drones. They're actually being controlled by human pilots. It's the humans that are doing this, not the robots. So I make a little proposition, a minor suggestion. Let's take Asimov's first law. A robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. And let's just make one word substitution. Think about it. What if? What if? Thank you.